uh, change slides, just say next slide. Okay, so hello everybody. So I'm going to present first results to paint with a, uh, via a large program with the VLC sphere, and we are surveying basically large asteroids, so essentially bodies with diameters above 100 kilometers. Next. Next slide. Okay. So um, we were awarded uh, a bit more than 150 hours, uh, basically in 2017. So the program started in, in April 2017. And so the purpose of this uh, survey is to image um, large asteroids with, with the, uh, the SPHERE instrument, which is a new in, uh, generation instrument which appeared at the VLT in 2014. And so the observations have spread, uh, were initially spread over the fourth semester, but, but we got an extension because we had some time loss, and so it's ex it extended until September 30, 2019. So all observations are performed in service mode, um, which is good because we get the thing we want, which is not, uh, not so nice because we don't go to Chile, but uh, anyway, the, we have a scene constraint uh, that is below 0.8 arc seconds, so pretty good scene conditions. Next slide, please. So, um, so, so there are two reasons why we focus on 100 kilometer size bodies. First of all, uh, obviously because they are large and we can resolve them, but also because these objects are considered, many of them at least, as primordial in the sense that uh, we, there are some collegial models that, that suggest that instead of being rubble piles, uh, much like the, the smaller bodies with diameters below 100 kilometers, or perhaps this limit is not exact, and perhaps below 50 kilometers, and in any case, there's some hope that many large bodies with diameters above 100 kilometers are primordial in the sense that their uh, initial internal structure has not been completely erased via subsequent giant collisions. Of course, the outer shell has been affected by impacts, but there's some hope that the internal structure is relatively in intact. And so for the largest bodies, there's, uh, we expect uh, minimal macroporosity via giant impacts, and therefore the density for these guys is uh, an excellent tracer for their internal structure. Next slide, please. So among the large guys, there are about 200 bodies with diameters uh, above 100 kilometers and only 30 with, uh, with a diameter above 200 kilometers. So for most of these bodies, but actually not all, um, so well, the orbit is very well constrained, but and as well as the albedo, uh, for some of these objects, we may not have uh, the visible and near infrared spectrum, at least not a near infrared spectrum. And most importantly for most of these bodies, the mass and as well as the 3D shape and hence volume are not well constrained, and therefore uh, the density is uh, elusive for many of these objects. And in addition, for many of, most of these bodies, uh, uh, a detailed understanding of the surface topography uh, is non-existent, and therefore it implies that we have very few geologic uh, and geophysical constraints uh, for these objects. Next slide, please. So here I show ra rapidly the, the objects that have been visited by spacecraft. So among the largest guys, uh, two were visited via a rendezvous mission, namely Sirius and Vesta, and, and uh, Lutetia was flown by the Rosetta mission. So we have only three of these guys that have been covered, and still partially in the case of Lutetia, uh, the, the, the flyback covers around 60% of its surface. And so for the remaining bodies, uh, we have uh, little constraint regarding their surface topography, geology, and also density many of, for many of these guys. Next slide. Okay, so the output of the survey is to deliver uh, as, as precise as possible 3D shapes and thus volumes for all bodies. Uh, and the 3D shapes are produced using the, the ADAM algorithm, which not, doesn't only use the images that is the composed images of our survey, but also like curves and star occultation data when those data uh, exist. Then as an extent, the volumes are combined with mass determination and then we constrain the density. Uh, but we also use the 3D shape model as well as the high resolution images to characterize the surface topography, perform a reconnaissance of craters with sizes above 30 kilometers in diameter, and uh, which allows us to characterize, first of all, the response of the outer shell to impacts, which is to some extent related to composition. And so we have already a hint of what is directly beneath the surface in terms of uh, ice rock ratio. 
and also uh, more generally it allows investigating the, and characterizing the collision history of individual targets. And finally, there is a potential for discovery of new satellites with, with our survey. So far, we didn't discover anyone, any new satellite, but it's still a possibility. Next slide, please. So here is a quick synthesis of after three semesters of observation. So uh, 94 hours out of the 124 hours allocated were executed, implying we lost 30 hours, and those 30 hours will be recovered via fifth semester at the end of our program. So we have already a good rotation coverage of uh, for 30 targets, uh, good coverage implying uh, four epochs. So basically what we do, we cover, uh, we try to cover uh, our target next, uh, to acquire a series of images every 60 degrees. So basically every target is covered by uh, six uh, observations. So here's the color code. That, um, so we had initially a few observations with the uh, infrared imager IRDIS uh, for the same targets, uh, but we then stopped because uh, the simple uh, instrument, so the, the, the indivisible, was so much more powerful that we just continued with Zimpol. So in terms of publications, we have already four papers that have been accepted for publication. Two are already uh, online, and two are in press uh, by Kari et al. and Sidi et al. on Daphne and Vesta. And this one that they are currently under review regarding Iris. Next slide, please. So here uh, I display um, the, the, the um, I highlight the 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 the, the, the progress that has been made with um, via the sphere instrument with respect to the previous uh, generation uh, adapted optics instrument which was NACO. So it's still the same telescope. You can but you can you can measure how well now we can resolve craters in the case of Pallas. So just uh, to specify, so Pallas in, in, with the NACO observation had a slightly larger angular diameter. But at that time, even such large body was uh, still uh, roughly unresolved potato, and now with sphere we really start to to have uh, surface details that that couldn't be um, uh, catched before with any uh, observing system, including HSC. Next slide, please. So here I compare um, kind of uh, spacecraft data. And uh, sphere data, so on the left you have an image that was acquired uh, with the Osiris uh, instrument on board Rosetta during the flyby of the Lutetia, so that this was when the spacecraft was at uh, 70,000 kilometers. And on the right you see, you can see uh, Iris um, from Earth and um, of course there's some uh, blurring in the image because the, the, the atmosphere can't be perfectly removed, but to some extent we could we can already say that there's some similarity in, in the details, uh, at least regarding the largest craters, highlighting the, the progress made from the ground with respect to uh, a flyby mission like, like Lutetia. So, of course, I'm cheating in the sense that uh, Lutetia was then flown by a Rosetta at a distance of 3,000 kilometers, and then the, the images during the closest approach with, were, had significant resolution, but at least it shows um, that what we do from the ground is comparable with a flyby mission at such a distance that is uh, 70,000 kilometers. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, so the, 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 we started our program um, uh, with an absence of benchmark targets. So benchmark targets being uh, Lutetia, Ceres and Vesta. So the, all these targets weren't observable at the, right at the beginning of the survey. And so we had to wait until uh, this year regarding Vesta in May uh, to, to catch the first images and to show how well um, um, what we see in our image is correct. We are not inventing artificial features and uh, it was very useful to calibrate our deconvolution procedure and demonstrate that actually what we are pretending to see is correct and not uh, something aberrant. So please, next slide. So here you have um, the vest, so Vesta three times. Um, the, on the left uh, column is the deconvolved image of sphere. On the very right, you have a synthetic image produced with the OASIS software developed by Laurent Jordan in, in Marseille. 
uh, where you don't have the albedo information, and exactly in the middle you have the same uh, uh, synthetic image over which we projected the albedo map uh, produced by Schroeder et al. a few years ago. Uh, so what you can see uh, via this comparison is that first of all the uh, so the contours are very precise, and that's, so we made a, a specific figure in the paper. So the contours are very precisely reproduced with the images and the deconvolution. Um, we can resolve craters as small as 25 kilometers in diameter. So then uh, a difficulty um, in the case of Vesta is as you can see the albedo uh, markings are very contrasted and uh, they make it difficult to see the craters even if you compare the, the two synthetic images in the middle and on the right. When you overprint the, the, the albedo it gets more difficult to see the craters because then the, the albedo markings uh, get, uh, bring some confusion with respect to the shadows on the craters and, and, and so it's, it's not so easy to, to see craters in the case of FESTA. In any case, we can see some of the craters with diameters uh, above 30 kilometers, not all. And uh, in addition, I wanted to comment on the albedo, as you can see, the um, now, now we get a really a high resolution, I mean, it, it gets close to what we can simulate with the the dawn uh, values in the sense that we can really resolve uh, dark features with a uh, high accuracy or bright spots or um, and then also the topographic um, features such as the 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 Vasilvia mound um, next slide please so we show additional images so the second series of images so here you see uh, additional images so um so essentially, with respect to the Dawn mission, so <clears throat> if we would synthesize the main results and findings in terms of geology and topography, so there was the north-south uh, dichotomy in terms of craters, the equatorial truth, um, and also discovering that the fact that the, the, the South Pole was consisting of two overlapping craters and not a single impact, and not a single crater. So uh, as of today, we don't see the crater dichotomy. Uh, with a sphere and an 8-bit class telescope, we don't have sufficient resolution to, dis to, to resolve it. Uh, in principle, with uh, the forthcoming generation, we should be able to resolve them, as well as the equator of truth, we are quite at the limit uh, to resolve them from the ground. And uh, But we already resolved pretty well the, the mound, uh, the Rassilia mound. Next slide, please. I uh, will go through the first papers that, I were, that were released to show a bit of the diversity of results we, we got with, with this survey so far. So I will start with uh, Julia, which was the first paper to be published. So in this paper, was, uh, we tried to link uh, our images uh, with uh, dynamical simulations sim simulating the, the, the family forming events. So um, essentially, a few years ago, a small collision family was discovered um, and uh, linked to asteroid Julia. And so we we will find this such dynamic work and found that it should be a pretty young family with an age between 30 and 100 million years, 20, 20 million years. All members are pretty small with diameters below 2.5 kilometers. And um, uh, we further constraint via neural simulation the size of the impact crater, which would be to create such a family, which would have a diameter above 60 kilometers. And uh, it's created following the impact with a projectile of a, of a diameter of eight kilometers. And when we went through our images, we had only one candidate with such a uh, diameter in terms of impact crater, and is the one highlighted with the red, the red arrow, which, uh, and that feature is uh, uh, 75 kilometers wide. Next slide, please. So regarding uh, Daphne, so we got a few epochs and uh, they were combined with the many epochs that had been acquired with Keck to uh, reconstruct pretty precisely its shape. And also all these epochs were um, uh, used to determine a very accurate orbit of the satellite. And so allowing a, pre a very precise mass determination that is around, uh, that is uh, what we call, uh, one, between 1.7 and 1.8 uh, grams per centimeter cube, which is, corresponds to basically a slightly under dense CM, uh, a CM like body with a minimal uh, 
uh, macroporosity. And so this leads us to, to infer that most likely, um, so just to specify, uh, Daphne has uh, the same spectrum as CM like chondrite, and this gives us pretty good concern perhaps on the internal structure of uh, CM like bodies that are likely formed in homogeneous and uh, they don't have a, probably not a, a, a core, uh, for example, an anhydrous core uh, consistent of anhydrous silicates, but probably their the internal structure is, is intact. Next slide, please. So with our survey, we got first images of Psyche. Um, we will re observe Psyche in, in a few months and its uh, angular resolution, which will be at that time much higher than it was in, uh, during the, that first event. So in any case, um, via those, these observations, we could uh, refine its uh, volume estimate and, uh, and therefore its density, and we, we, we found a density of four grams per centimeter cube, which is significantly lower than that of iron nitrites. And, um, but, but on the other hand, compatible with that of mesosiderites. And when you look at the spectrum of psyche, it's fairly possible that mesosiderites could be, could be an analog for that, for that object. Um, in any case, what is important is that so far, when you look at all large, uh, main um, they sh when you look at their densities, it corresponds to a composition with minimal, to a body with minimal macroporosity. So of course, on, the, on this basis, we could well in suspect, for example, that the surface was contaminated by exogenic, exogenic dust or, or meteoritic like dust, and that the internal structure could consist of a large fraction of voids, but this is at least not consistent with any large body that has been observed so far in terms of internal structure. Usually, macroporosity macro key values for such large bodies. So, for, for reference psyches and more than 200 kilometers in diameter, is really well below 15%. Uh, so, quite far from uh, the, the, the 40, 50% required here to match the iron nitrides. Next slide, please. So, here are the Four series of images we, we got for Iris. So this is one of the largest S-type asteroids. And um, as you can see, so <clears throat> uh, when this object was observed, it was pulled on. So basically, we see the craters with uh, rotation, um, basically always seeing the same uh, uh, portion of the surface. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And so, uh, <clears throat> We could constrain it very well its uh, density around 2.7, which is pretty current with LL chondrites. And um, next slide. Yeah. So um, what is important here is that we also performed a comparison with the radar model. So here you have a direct comparison between the radar model on the top and the images on the bottom. And you can see that actually the radar model uh, what was pretty good at, at, at finding some craters, uh, when you, uh, it's a pity that I cannot show you with the mouse, but you have on, on the bottom, on the, on the, if you take the image on the very right and on the bottom, the craters on the bottom, you can see that they are well reproduced by the radar model. But in general, the, the, the shape is highly exaggerated with respect to the, to the, the to the images. And in this respect, the, 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 the 3D model is derived from the images that is on the slide before, you might just show it again, uh, is more in agreement with the, with the, the surface topography and the, and the images. Next slide. So now that we can uh, find craters at the surfaces of our targets, we can also name them. So here the, the craters uh, were given names of, of flowers and, and of, of um, um, colors, I mean. And, um, and so we highlight all the craters in the size range 20 to 40 kilometers. And we also measure the depth from the images. And uh, <clears throat> the the depth size ratio for our craters appears slightly larger than the one of Vesta, and we 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 infer that this may be due to the different uh, gravity regime between the two bodies. Um, 
uh, creators getting uh, refilled with uh, regolith on larger bodies, for instance, uh, such as Vesta. And so, uh, um, for such a smaller size body, <coughs> having sharper yeah, creators might not be so surprising. Slightly sharper creators than than on Vesta. Next slide, please. Yeah, we have time for about one more slide. Yeah, I'm but I'm done basically. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, so what was uh, pretty intriguing with this body is that on on, on for, for a large portion of its um, shape, it, it seems very highly ellipsoidal, but uh, so this is a, just a simple fit with a, an ellipsoid, but you can see that, that there is a kind of missing material on, 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 on the equator, and this may open the possibility that uh, such objects formed really with an ellipsoidal shape. So that's one, also one of the questions uh, within our survey. Huh? Uh, we expect uh, a body larger than 400 kilometers to form as an ellipsoid, but then when you go down uh, to 300 or 200 kilometer sized bodies, then the question remains, how did they form? Did they were form like uh, random potatoes or did they already have uh, like a uh, kind of ellipsoidal shape? And so this may open the possibility, this needs to be confirmed with uh, statistically with uh, additional uh, targets. That it forms like an ellipsoid and an impact created this, uh, this possible basin. And uh, uh, just to finish on that, there is no family associated with this asteroid. So, um, uh, if this impact occurred, either it was very uh, early in the history of the solar system, or uh, simply the, the fragments were so dispersed via the collision that we don't we don't taste it today. And you can go to the conclusion final slide. <clears throat> Next. Okay, I will leave you with a conclusion. So just to comment, so as soon as papers get accepted, we post the data uh, reduced and deconvolved on the link that is highlighted in red. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you, Pierre. Are we ready for the... Yeah, Dante's going to be it. Operator, is Dante on the line? And so I'm afraid we need to...